So okay. thank you everyone for joining. Um, let me do like a quick intro and then go into the um, kind of the presentation itself. So my name is Kirill Tsvakarev. I started working in games when I was 21. And uh, so I've been working like for almost 20 years in uh, video games. And in this presentation, I want to kind of give some information from industry experts on how to work in games and what's what's it like working in games and maybe give you some advice as to how to make this process easier for you right so a couple of words about 80 level so 80 level is basically a website where we publish a, a bunch of stuff on production of 3d and video game content uh, there's a lot of use people really like it and uh, apart from this we also help artists um, find work. So we have a special recruiting service that has companies subscribing to it and looking into the database of, of our uh, artists. But overall, we kind of help to promote young talent. We help to showcase their work and to just bring them more um, exposure that you all guys all love. Um, so I wanted to start this story um, with another story from uh, Blizzard. Uh, and it was told uh, during DICE 2017 by, by Jeff Kaplan, so the guy uh, on a sticker there. Jeff Kaplan is one of the managers who oversaw uh, Overwatch production, and he was like one of the big figures who worked for um, World of Warcraft. So the, the story goes like this. So they were creating a bunch of maps for Overwatch, and all of those maps were uh, kind of centered in different locations uh, in the world. They were not realistic. They were kind of like, you know, a vision of the future of what's it like, you know, in the year, yada, yada, to live on planet Earth. And everybody, everything was kind of nice, uh, good looking, bright, and so on. So they have a very good environment art team at Blizzard, and um, they have kind of artists from all over the place. So they have artists from, you know, Belgium and Brazil and Germany and so on. And they were given their own kind of twist on this. They were given their own version of what Hollywood was like. And uh, Jeff Kaplan and his team, they really liked it because it was like, again, in the mood of the game, very bright, kind of like a place where you would want to go on a holiday. And uh, there is a part in the map there where they have to go to the back lot of the studio, to, like a Hollywood studio, to check out how it's all like. And none of the artists was at, at that kind of place. So they, they rented the bus and they drove them from you know Irvine uh, to Hollywood to kind of check out the place. But on their way back, they were actually driving through the real Hollywood like the the real like Hollywood Boulevard and stuff. And uh, when the environment art team came back, they started fixing uh, their uh, their sketches and fixing their environments, saying that we got it all wrong. <laughs> like this, this vision of Hollywood that the guys from Belgium had that had nothing to do with what real Hollywood was like. And uh, Jeff Kaplan was kind of like in a, in a mess because he thought, oh my God, they're going to ruin the whole thing and they're going to create this, you know, more realistic Hollywood, which is not like 100% what you see in this uh, level picture. So um, the metaphor here is uh, pretty straightforward. So this level that you see is something that video game industry wants you to see, right? So you want to be perceived of, like this kind of like dream factory, like a place where everything is bright and shiny and you play games all the time and you're like, enjoy yourself and there's everything's nice and everybody's nice and so on. But the reality, it might be a little bit different. So in my perspective, like the purpose of this uh, presentation today is just to kind of describe to you what's it like to be in the industry and what are the skills and maybe some of the habits that you might acquire that can help you um, stay in this industry and uh, get a lot of fun from it and not just be kind of mesmerized by the pretty picture and then when you open the door and get inside the studio it's just like the real uh, Hollywood Boulevard. So how do we how do we approach this? How do we do it? How do we get these 
um, questions uh, answered. So what I did is I went on my Facebook page and I posted uh, a post saying, uh, guys, give some advice for students who want to get into the video game industry and who are graduating and they want to kind of grow and, you know, work there. And we got like a bunch of people, like over a hundred comments from very uh, well-known guys who are working in environment art and character design and uh, big studios like Insomniac and Bungie and, you know, so on, CD Projekt and so on, so on. And uh, they gave, a, gave us a lot of uh, very nice, insightful recommendations and they are at the base uh, of this presentation. So let me kind of go and start with some of these things and I will uh, elaborate on some of these topics and then at the end you will uh, be able to ask me questions and I will be happy to answer. So the first uh, advice was that you need to choose wisely. That the, And they're all very humorous, so everybody says like, maybe that's not a good career to take me to something else i really like this guy who was just kind of like don't don't um but mostly it means that if you're um and there was a very good comment from dan saying that if you are in this industry you have to really love it like if you don't really love it you might not make it there because it's very hard and it's very competitive and there's a lot of stuff that you need to kind of tackle. So building games and playing games are two different things. So you really need to love to build games. And that's one of the big advice that we got. So the second one goes like this, that you need to know your basics. And um, this is something that is often overlooked. And we know because we go through like a, a hundred of portfolios every week where artists are applying to a 80 level talent. And we see that a lot of them actually lack this, you know, fundamentals that um, great artists have. Because the, the rule of thirds is used by every environment artist anywhere, everywhere, all the time to make, you know, the composition to put the camera in place and so on. The same goes for anatomy, because if you're building like an, a huge worker or if you're building, you know, a beautiful tiny princess or whatever, they pretty much have the same anatomy. So you might as well know this. By the way, this article about anatomy was one of the most read on our website because people were like, wow, that's uh, something new, <laughs> which shouldn't be <laughs> you actually, if, especially if you're in the character art development or if you're in environment art you should know composition and those kind of things so another big thing is that everybody suggests that you need to be a, a lifelong student and be curious all the time what does it what does it mean because everybody says this right so you have to be a lifetime student so learning and getting into something new is something uh, super important if you want to survive in this industry, especially if you're in production. So I have a slide here from a presentation by uh, a DICE, like an EA company, and they were working on Battlefield and then they started working on uh, Star Wars uh, Battlefront. And they basically adopted uh, photogrammetry. They started working with photogrammetry and this allowed them to cut the production time in half. So everybody was kind of like building more assets and building more realistic assets and so on. So I guess the main takeaway here is that if they, if you don't really know uh, photogrammetry or you don't want to learn anything about photogrammetry, you are missing out. And basically at the end, you're going to get fired from DICE because it's at, at the core of their workflow. So learning something new and being a lifelong student is essential in environment art or any kind of game dev work or in any work at all. It's because if you stop learning and if you stop kind of getting into the details and so on, you're missing out and you're becoming less competitive. And uh, at the end, you will not be able to do the same work that younger people do. We have a lot of examples of people who are like over 50 working in companies like Sony Santa Monica or Naughty Dog, and they're producing work that is better <laughs> than the stuff you guys are doing and the stuff that, you know, people from, you know, Gnomon or any other big school are doing. And that kind of tells you, like, imagine on how many processes have they gone through 
during their lifetime. They started from very primitive stuff, and now they're kind of working with AI powered, you know, substance designer things and so on. So being a lifelong student and being very curious about the tech and the world in general, this is one of the biggest things that you need to keep in mind if you're into games. So another big thing is uh, to be be inspired. Well, being inspired is a, a corporate talk for uh, appropriating something that you didn't come up with, right? So as artists, we kind of look at all the other work and we're kind of like getting inspired thinking, oh, that's a nice color, I might try it. This is like a nice shape I might use and so on. And um, you shouldn't be afraid of doing this because everybody's doing this. So. I have a little screenshot of a fan art about Squid Game. And Squid Game has very kind of iconic designs where um, the designs were actually stolen from another Netflix uh, show, Money Heist, right? And uh, uh, a little um, console that you might be aware of. So everybody's kind of taking little things from all the other places and they putting them together and something new comes up. The important thing here is not to mix being inspired and just cloning somebody's work. So cloning somebody's work is bad. You shouldn't do it. Like if somebody did like a nice, I don't know, like a God of War hammer or something, or he doesn't have a hammer, he has an ax. So he, if he, he created this ax, don't copy the same ax. Do something, do your own twist on whatever, right? It, but it's okay if you can take you know ideas from different places and use them to build something uh, of your own. People are doing this. Look at Netflix. Um, another uh, big thing, the theme kind of that went through all the hundred comics was that you need to practice and you need to learn by doing. So I actually had a slide in the presentation before where I was like, you need to read more, you need to observe the world. And then I thought it was a rubbish slide because um, it doesn't actually have any action into it. Because, yeah, you need to look at the world. Yeah, you need to read a lot. But mostly you're just practicing. You're just trying to do the same thing all over again and so on. And I really like this slide because it shows kind of the progress uh, that happens. So this is the guy who started working at... Um, one of the Lucas Art Studios, and he was doing an um, Indiana Jones game for Wii. I don't know if anyone in the uh, in the room really remembers what Wii is, but it's a console kind of before Switch and some of the other um, consoles that Nintendo made, and they had like uh, motion designed uh, controllers and a bunch of other stuff. And this guy was kind of doing art. He was doing like these crazy 2D things and sketches and so on, and uh, it kind of brought results. So in the end, he started building those crazy material balls, and then he worked on Uncharted 4, and he, he the last game he worked was uh, Last of Us Part 2. It's uh, Brian, uh, and he, he's an amazing artist. There is a link to his uh, uh, art station page. You can check it out. He's, he's done tremendous work. He's uh, in, incredibly talented. But just like you, he started as a student. So you kind of grow and you build new things and you acquire new skills and then you can do something like uh, you know last of us took part two um another big advice we got is that you need to work on your portfolio so i'm not going to go into like the details and tell you that you need to put this on your portfolio or that on your portfolio it's not really um, why I'm here. I, I think you can read this all over the net and everybody has kind of their own opinion about it. Um, what I really want to do, uh, to, to tell you is like two things, because we as a team, we go through a lot of portfolios every week. And um, some of the two things that we need to, uh, to, to kind of get into the world. So first of all, we need to understand what are you all about, right? So what are you doing? Like if you're a vehicle artist, then let's see the vehicles. If you're an environment artist, let's see the detailed environment. If you're a material artist, uh, let's see creative, interesting materials. Because if you're everything, we don't really know. We don't really understand what you do. I know people like to put like 3D generalist on, uh, on their portfolios and it's like everything. But when you look at it, you see that everything on the portfolio is not really great. 
So it's very hard to make a decision whether it's like a pass or no pass. And another thing is that uh, you need to put some quality stuff there, something that you're proud of, somebody where you got feedback and you improved it and it looks nice. Not just from your point of view, but from everybody's point of view. That's super important as well. Because this is how people are making decisions whether to hire you or even to start some kind of communication with you. And this is basically your face. So whenever you're approaching any kind of work in, in art, especially in games, don't send your like CV, don't send your like letter, like how I love Blizzard, I want to work there and that kind of stuff. Just send them their your portfolio, which explains what you do and that it has, a, you know, a nice work that kind of fits Blizzard or whatever the company uh, it does. And um, I want to emphasize here that you can you can specialize, and that's fine, right? Because um, it's okay to know what you like, but at the same time, you need to know what the market needs, if it makes any sense, right? Um, I like this screenshot. It's a work by uh, Jasmine, and I actually met Jasmine. I was very lucky to meet her at uh, Cologne during Gamescom a couple of years ago, and she was kind of like looking for work at that time and so on. But if you go on her portfolio and you check out uh, the work that she's doing, you immediately understand what uh, is she all about, right? Because she does these crazy, you know, stylized landscapes. He, she builds like stylized sushi and all that stuff. She's all about stylized stuff. She doesn't have any vehicles. She doesn't have any hard service materials. She really likes this particular thing. And she's kind of aiming the companies that are doing the same thing. So I think she's working in Kano or some other studio that's doing similar to her style, right? And I have examples like on the other uh, trajectory where we have guys who are creating very uh, messy, gory materials like, you know, rotten skin and all that kind of stuff. And they ended up working for uh, the remake of the Demon Souls. So it's just going to show us more. All right, so another big thing, and it's kind of like a recurring theme in all of the comments we had, is that um, feedback and rejection, it's not something personal. So it's uh, if you get some feedback, it doesn't mean that people hate you or they don't like you. It's just like, it's feedback, so you don't have to take it personally. And uh, I found a really interesting study from uh, Columbia University, and uh, they basically asked students who were uh, studying French, on what kind of instructors do they like? So this, and, and the results are pretty obvious. So the students who just started, they really like instructors who are, you know, more positive. They're like giving them very slight, you know, non-obtrusive feedback, like, oh, you're doing good, you're great, keep it up and so on. But at the same time, when students already know some French and they can't speak, they want instructors to criticize them more. So they want to give them more feedback, say that you said this wrong, you said that wrong, and so on and so forth. I think that it might help you in your career in general if you're looking for the second time. Like this, the artists that are giving like more feedback, more critical things. And then you need to take this feedback, you need to implement it into your work, you need to think about it and so on. But most importantly, um, you don't need to take it personally because it's not really about you, it's about you know, your work and making it great. Because there will be people who are gonna say, what are you doing here? I mean, your art is garbage and you, you know, you shouldn't be working here. I'm gonna go to HR and you're gonna get fired or something like this. Maybe this is too extreme, but uh, it's mostly about the art. It's not that they don't really like you. You just need to think about it and improve your work or whatever you're doing. And that brings us to another point is that you need to know how to give feedback. And I really like this um, quote from Anne Lomont. Anne Lomont is, uh, she's a writer, but she's also, um, she runs a course on writing at the university. And there was a story inside one of those courses where one of the students brought us a short story and um, everybody read it and uh, it was kind of bad. It was not a very interesting story. And then it was a time to give feedback. And Anne Lamott was like, yeah, it's, it's OK. I mean, you can improve this character, that character. You can give it a little bit more life here. And everybody kind of followed. Like, and there was like a circle. Like, 
like Alcoholic Anonymous are writers are very similar. They're like giving you feedback and prove this a bit and improve that a bit and, and so on. And then in the end, there was uh, one girl and she kind of stood up and said, this is the worst story I've ever read. You absolutely have zero talent. You shouldn't be doing it. And then she asked, am I the only one who sees this? Like in the end. And she went all red, like, and uh, so in the end where uh, the, that guy wasn't very happy with the feedback either who wrote the story. So she, at the end, she kind of approached Anne Lamott and she asked, like, do you think I'm a horrible person for saying that? She said, no, but you don't always have to chop with the sword of truth. You can point with it too, right? So you don't really have to be very harsh with your feedback. You can kind of push the person in the right direction, but giving them a general direction, that's fine. Okay, another uh, big thing, and uh, you should know that I, I know a lot of technical artists. And there's a lot of people who are doing Houdini and all that kind of stuff on uh, on my feed. So um, they gave a very solid advice. And I think this is something uh, that all of you might uh, benefit from, is that um, you need to learn something techy. You need to put a tech into your you know description on, on the portfolio. And I have a couple of um, screenshots from the production of Ascent here. Ascent is an uh, Xbox title. It's developed by Neon Giant. And if you don't know about Neon Giant, Neon Giant is a studio that was formed by a lot of people from machine games. They were doing um, uh, Wolfenstein games for Bethesda. And they heavily relied on Houdini to build the levels and to the places inside the game. Why did they do it? Because they need high quality and they need a lot of content because they're producing a game that costs money. And people usually want to pay money for games that has a lot of stuff and they can invest a lot of time in it. So if you look at the, the Ada level basically has a lot of guys who are doing environment art and props and characters and everybody likes doing it, right? But at the same time, we have very few technical artists and VFX artists. And these are actually the people that everybody needs. So whenever we have a company approaching, it's mostly they're looking for some tech art or a technical animator or like a VFX artist who can do like, you know, um, blueprints and all this stuff, particle effects and that kind of stuff. So it doesn't mean that you have to do this all the time, right? But if you know something about it, if you're kind of experiment with it and if you can use, be an environment artist, but also use VFX, like it often happens in studios where they get, just give you a library of, you know, particle effects and then you go and you play around it and they put it all over your environment. So that's always a benefit. That's never a bad thing. Okay. So, uh, the next one is it, it was, a, it was a comment on my feed. So it's, you, you know, not what to do right, but what not to do wrong. And uh, I really like this example from um, from the Witcher team. So basically, they were building Witcher Three, and they were, and it's a huge game. If anybody played, it's like massive. It's crazy, and uh, they had a lot of problems with bugs and optimizations there. And while they were doing the bug hunt, they found this asset that they had in the game, which was a bucket filled with chickens. So it was like a bucket. And they put a bunch of chickens in it, and it was like 15 million triangles. It was 15 million triangles. It was like a city in a bucket. So don't do these things. Like be mindful of whatever other people are doing. Know the requirements that you have. Think about the poly content. So all of those other things where you won't get, um, uh, you know blamed by technical artists for doing this. Thing. And the, another example from the Witcher thing is when they needed to place rocks like on the environment somewhere. And instead of rocks, they took like a huge mountain, again, all of like poly count there, and they just used the tip of it. So, uh, and the rest of the mountain was kind of like under the plane, hidden. But it was still build, being calculated. So that's something that you want to avoid, that you don't get super lazy when you're doing this. And Again, no, no, the tech. And another example for this one is 
learn to do uh, uh, unwrapping for your models. That's also a good thing. I know everybody thinks they know how to do it, but most people do it not in a very good way. Okay, another uh, example. This is something that might help you get into the industry. I was struggling a lot to find the illustrations for this because uh, the games are changing uh, so much and they're uh, something that was um, kind of hip at my time, may not be hip at yours. So this guy is uh, Brendan Green. He actually was um, a web designer. He was designing web and uh, he started playing with DayZ and he started modifying and he created this battle royale thing again inspired by the um, the, the movie from the Japanese director and he then in the end he created PUBG and PUBG then influenced a bunch of other things and it was all from a mod uh, uh, this guy is Jordan De Jong he's an um, evangelist and epic games and he started again by modifying Unreal Tournament. He was kind of like uh, back in the day. He was modifying Unreal Tournament, building different levels, blah, 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 and then sort of became an evangelist, a technical artist, and he released two of his own games, and now he works for Epic, kind of telling stories about how great Unreal Engine 5 is. And then there's this guy, who is a creator of Counter-Strike, which started as a Half-Life mode, not Half-Life 2, but Half-Life. It was a game like that. And then he worked on uh, Counter-Strike, then he worked on Rust, and then now he worked on uh, Black Desert Online. So he's like a, this huge, incredible portfolio, of some of the most, you know, best Rusting games ever. And this guy started in, you know, modeling and figure, figuring out about, you know, a mod about shooting people. And then um, another thing, which is networking, that you need to visit events like these, you need to go to GDC, Gamescom, and if you can't do like this, you don't have the budget to do it, you can go like smaller, like, you know, game jams or whatever, or whatever things you have in your uh, city or the place where you live. And if you think there aren't any of those uh, conventions or whatever, you're wrong. I mean, there's definitely people who like to do games and they want to get together because it's like this, again, like this Anne Lamott story, like you need to get it in a circle and talk about whatever you're building. Like, and people would give you very soft <laughs> feedback saying, your game maybe not as ideal, maybe Nintendo did it better. But upon the whole, what I'm trying to say here that you do need to connect with other people because eventually it will help you to get a job or to get another job or to build your own company or you know work on a game that you really like. Um, so we're almost at the end here, and another uh, like big thing that we had um, in the comments, and I think it's very valuable, is that you need to take care of yourself, because crunch is something that's going to happen all the time, every time in any game, and this, you can't really avoid it, and if you worked in any company, you know that it's kind of like part of the journey, but at the same time, you do need to sleep and uh, I think it's very important. So you need to rest. Your body needs to rest. You need to go, I don't know, go for a walk, you know, spend time with your kids if you have kids or with your dog if you have a dog uh, or your wife. And then uh, another piece of it was kind of part there is you need to think about money as well. So although it might not be super evident, but you need to make savings, you need to think about your retirement because right now it seems that retirement is very far away but it's not it's really not so you need to think about it even if you can put like a hundred bucks into some kind of retirement account you should do it all right so you need to take all of this that i that i just told you with a little bit of a, a grain of salt right because a lot of these advice they have the survivor's bias and survivor's bias this is a story where you know, I, I think you all know it about the planes. They came back from the war and they were counting bullets and saying that we need to improve the parts where there were bullets. But uh, uh, on the contrary, they need to, you know, improve the parts where there were no bullets because the, there were a lot, of, a lot of planes that returned, but there were also a lot of planes that didn't return. And those are the planes that kind of like mattered. 
right? So this advice, it works for people who already work in the industry. It's kind of like it works for them. So your journey might be a little bit different. And that's totally fine because it's your journey, right? You need to take it at your own pace and you need to try to do whatever you want to do and so on. So keep those uh, advice in mind and uh, just to try to learn from whatever is going on around you. And um, I just wanted to kind of end up and tell that 80 level talent has a special program for students where uh, we help them get hired by companies like Breakdown, Rebellion, you know, Hypix. So we have like a bunch of clients there. Um, those are great companies. We try to filter them out. We need to we'll only work with the best. We want to make sure that you're not going to be scammed or anything like that and that you get experience and you'll be able to work on interesting titles. So if you're interested, uh, there are, I think there are codes, codes distributed and stuff like that. So you can go on the website, uh, go through the registration, enter the codes, uh, get your portfolio. And then we feature the guys that we really like from the database, feature them on the website, uh, on Instagram and all over. And we also, uh, help promote them in the companies and clients that we have uh, to help them land a better job. And that's a good opportunity because you not only get a chance to get a job somewhere, but you also have an opportunity to see other countries, maybe go to the United States and so on. So for a level also helps with publications, which is great when you're applying for a visa or like a O1 visa or H1P visa for, you know, US and so on. I'm not going to stop uh, that much about it because I thought the, I think you have information about those things. So yes, join us. And uh, if you have any questions, I uh, will be very happy to answer them. Uh, I'm just going right to drop now. in to say that uh, um, guys and girls here, uh, we have uh, uh, Art Heroes access to 80 level portal published uh, by the end of your programs and also in partnerships and uh, student partnerships and discounts. There is uh, there is a link uh, for everyone so that you uh, can access and uh, uh, make use of it. That's uh, there is a special art heroes in right there. Uh, thank you, Kirill. That was really, really cool. And we've got a bunch of questions. Um, I can shoot them to you. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Okay, so the first question that we got actually was if um, you think the rules, the same rules and tips apply for cinematics, uh, games and like VFX industries. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I okay. think it, like especially with VFX and uh, like cinema in general, um, there's a there's maybe more tedious work there, like the like you work on a cloud that was in Titanic somewhere, right? And that's that's your that's your work, yeah, for a year. So. <laughs> True, true. Okay. Uh, so then uh, when um, you were um, you were giving a tip on um, knowing who you are and showing that from your portfolio. So Andrea is asking, is it okay to split portfolio into uh, distinct sections if I'm working on two things? Yes, we do have this a lot. Um, I would still have a section where you have all, like they have this or everything or all. Mm -hmm. You can have a look at the whole portfolio, but if you want to kind of um, help the search engines find you better, so yeah, you can put it like, this is the part where I do, you know, textures, this is where I do props, this is where I do environments. And so, so. Okay. Would you still recommend doing this uh, as of like, you know, keeping all of your <laughs> everything? <laughs> I, I do like when I can see everything in one okay. tool. Okay, cool. Uh, Matthias is asking, is it okay as a character artist doing stylized, semi-realistic and realistic characters, or is it better to focus on one thing if you don't really want, if you don't really know where you want to work in the future or for what are your skills best suited for? I think it's a, uh, you, you kind of said the answer uh, in the question. So you don't really know what you want to do in the future. So you should figure out what you want to do. <laughs> And then you should concentrate on that. I have an example. So I know that there is a, a character artist from Ukraine who really wants to work on uh, The Last of Us and the Naughty Dog uh, games. 
she knows this, this is her goal, and she kind of, you know, pivots and concentrates all of her portfolio to do this, to work on that kind of game. She's not doing stylized. Like I said, if you're doing stylized and then you're doing realistic and then you're doing maybe some animals and you're doing simulated fur, no, I don't think it's a good idea. Right, right. Okay, cool. So um, another question. Okay, also, Matthias, uh, how to get information about industry pipeline or workflow if you're still not working for a company? That's actually a very good question. I would suggest going to... Uh, GDC Vault. There's like GDC on YouTube, and there's like a bunch of videos there, and you can learn a lot from. The... I have some very weird noises. Coming. Yeah, 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 it's gone. Yeah, oh, somebody unmuted themselves, but that's okay. No? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, you can learn from there. You can go on uh, industry websites, so you can go on 80 level, and they we do showcase like how they build last of us and how they built some other big games and you can see the pipeline there like where, where do they go like in for example when uh, when they were doing god of war they don't technically have the engine like they they build everything in maya so that's their the pipeline and studios openly share this kind of information now they it's not like 10 or 20 years ago when everything was kind of like a secret Right now, it's like more open, so you will definitely be able to just Google most of it. Yep, cool. Um, next questions. Do you think those companies, like the companies that accept remote work, there's a question from Bryce. I don't know which companies do you mean, Bryce, but... Uh... So there are different points of view on this. Some companies do accept, uh, like the, the companies that we shared here, they do accept uh, remote workers. I know the Playground Games and Rebellion and uh, Applied Intuition, they, they all work remote, that's fine. Um, some companies don't, like for example, um, I know Microsoft tries to get everybody into the office. That's kind of like their, um, their approach. But at the same time, Epic Games allows you to work from everywhere, anywhere, and you just need to do your work and that's it. And they pay you very well, so. Don't consider this an advertisement for Epic Games. Okay, cool. Uh, next question, can we get these slides? Yes, guys, everybody who's registered here will get the slides, that's sure. Um, so um, asking for a ballpark, Aaron's question, asking for a ballpark, but if I continue to try and be a 3D art generalist, how much experience do you think recruiters would be looking for? I've used the tools for a couple of years, but I have no genuine work experience. They they don't care about experience. They just care about your portfolio. If the work of your portfolio is great and you have zero experience, they will hire you. That's not a problem for them. They might kind of interview you about your soft skills. And if, you, if you're not afraid of people, you're not going to run away if somebody approaches you. That's probably something they might do. But overall, they don't really care. They're just looking at they have something to do, and they're looking for the person who can do it. So that's it. Cool, perfect. Okay, well, um, uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, do we have more questions here? Is there, if there is anyone who I have not uh, pulled up, please uh, feel free to uh, to poke me here in the chat. Uh, and uh, yeah, feel free to ask more questions, guys. I think we have uh, maybe a few more minutes. Let me just scroll quickly up um, to see if... Um, okay, so yes, I, I found a question that we haven't answered. The stylized versus realistic character. What about games like Gears of War, where it's something in between? Yeah, I think it's still more um, towards realism when they're doing this. When you're thinking about stylized and if you want to work, in stylized, it's more companies like the, the style of Zelda, something like this. When they're talking about, uh, if you're talking about Coalition, the company that is doing uh, Gears of War right now, uh, it, it should be more towards realism, even if it's like a little bit, you know, hyperbole and uh, more grotesque, it's, it's still towards more realism. So you need to learn like a little bit of a different workflow, definitely more like PBR stuff, organic materials, 
but still you need to learn anatomy and all those like basics as well. Cool. And Jake is asking, what do you recommend to learn on the technical side? Oh, that's a I mean, deep I, I, question. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that you can learn and uh, never unlearn. <laughs> but one of the, some of the tools that you might uh, start kind of playing with, I think you definitely want to play with simulations. Uh, there is some simulation tools in Blender. There's definitely Houdini for you. There is also um, a lot of interest in just simple particle effects. Like people don't really know how to do that <laughs> very well. Okay. And another thing, uh, probably procedural generation, like procedural generation of biomes, of uh, you know buildings, uh, spaces, all that stuff. Also, Houdini is a great tool to kind of start playing with it. But it, it can be implemented in Unreal as well and many other tools. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, that's a great tip. So and another question uh, about the similar topic, Bryce, does 3D artists need to learn every software, Maya, 3ds Max, Blender, ZBrush, uh, etc. Because he was refused since he didn't know Maya, but knew 3ds Max. I mean, nobody can give you this uh, answer. And realistically, you can't learn all of it. Right. So I, I work with artists and I send them the file and I say, I don't really work with Maya. I just have like 3ds Max. So I will convert this into 3ds Max and I'm going to do my stuff in 3ds Max. Is this okay with me? For me, I don't really care as long as they give me the model that I can then pass along to the production. So I don't really think you need to worry that much about it. If you were refused, I mean, there are other companies where you can work. I think yeah. if you are in the industry, you need to learn, like if you're a texture artist, you probably need to know Photoshop and you probably need to know like Substance Painter. Because if you don't know these two, you're not really a texture artist. Yeah. And we keep the software conversation here with another one. If a person has zero experience in Maya, but they're very good using Blender, can they still work for that company? Uh, I heard that Blender is still new to the industry. I think what you just said, no, like, not, <laughs> yeah, definitely not new. The Blender has been around for a very long time. So people really know, it. and especially right now, it's kind of, they get, um, they get it more into the studio pipelines. The only problem with Blender that's not, um, it's not secure in terms of like corporate, uh, idea of security. So yeah. it's like open source software. So technically, realistically, somebody could build something to get into Blender and, you know, but most of those things, they don't really matter. Like if you are a, a freelancer and you want to work somewhere, you can build your stuff anywhere and just export it in the file that they, you know, they like With most companies, they don't really care about it. If your work is great, that per se, right? If your yeah. work is like not great, it's not about the software. Yeah. Um, Isabel uh, is asking, I would like to get a job in a stylized 3D field, but there is not much work around my area within that style. Uh, should I focus on working on more fitting styles to the companies near me or continue to follow my stylized path? I'm currently studying uh, game art as studying game artist as a game artist probably, and will hopefully work around next year. I mean, uh, it's kind of like a question. I don't know your situation. I don't know what's yeah. the place where you live and all those things. I feel like if you like to do one thing, then you should keep doing this. That the, if you like stylized, I mean, you can travel to another city and work there. That's fine. <laughs> and from my point of view, right, it, I agree. It, it's not that if, if there is, you know, if there is no work for journalists in my area, I will stop being a journalist. I will work in some other area, like yep. geographically, right? Well, that's exactly your example, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, for my portfolio, would, how would you feel if I created a new polished pieces compared to something larger, uh, like an interactive scene or mini game? I mean, so you why do you build, pieces, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't really understand. Why do you build like mini games or why do you put like interactive experiences on your portfolio? First of all, they're, they're probably not going to be as great. Uh, second, this is a team effort. It's your portfolio. It's not your team's portfolio, right? So you should put the stuff that you did. 
right? So again, definitely polished, small polished pieces are better than just one game that you develop, unless you developed a very cool game by yourself. But if you're in that kind of area, then maybe you should, you know, publish it and stop looking for work and start selling more copies of your game. Good. Um, I guess question for many people is the age a problem? I started to learn this at 29. Oh my God, you started learning at 29. That's I, I too don't late. Think it's a problem. <laughs> I don't think it's, too, I don't, I mean, I'm, 29 doesn't sound very late for me. <laughs> it's been not for me neither. For a very long yes, time. <laughs> same. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's fine if people start doing this when they're 40 and, you know. It, and it's, it's still just, not late, yeah. yes. Yeah, 100%. it's never late. Like yeah, I, yeah. I've heard a very interesting thing that it's, uh, you can always start doing whatever, even at 70, but you need to know where you're going. And if you don't really know where you're going, it's useless. Yes. Um Agree. And actually within this community at Art Heroes, we've got a bunch of students there. They're in their 50s and in their 60s. Like seriously, we've got so many. Like you just like it's online. We're all online. So not everybody knows who are who's like how old you are and where you're based. But uh, trust me, uh, we've got like a bunch of students that are, you know, past school age traditionally. Um, so, okay, next one. How do we get exposure as a character artist if we're still learning and we're not there yet? Uh, any tips for finding clients if we choose to go freelance? Yeah, I mean, if you're not there yet, then you will probably not get the job. Just saying. So <laughs> my, my, my opinion is that you can go into different groups, like on Discords and on uh, Facebook. We have like a group 80 level show and tell where you can just publish your stuff, get some feedback. And you can try Polycount. You can try a lot of other places uh, to kind of publish and get some feedback. And then when you're sure that it's, you know, comparable to whatever there is on the market, then you can start looking for a job. Exposure is like, it's not very hard to get, like getting a very good, you know, piece of work to publish. That's where the struggle is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alrighty, guys, I think we're done with the questions and it's just about time. So um, that's perfect. Uh, um, well, there is another um, comment. Do we have time for like one more question or we're done? Yes, one more, one more question is fine. Okay, uh, okay. I'm going to throw the last question and it's going to be this one. Uh, Matthias, you're lucky. Is ArtStation enough for a portfolio or shall we create a website? I mean, you shouldn't be asking me this question. I mean, I think you should start with 80 level talent <laughs> and maybe art station and then, and then just stop. I mean, be hands, no. But I mean, of course, the station is like the industry standard. So yeah, if you are there, it's fine. You don't need yeah. to get like 100 portfolios, but definitely 80 level talent. That's the second one probably. I would agree, guys. I would agree, guys. But definitely, uh, I see a lot of people actually putting so much effort in uh, buying templates and making like a like a website, like a proper website by themselves. And this is such an energy waste drain. Concentrate your time not on learning web design, but on learning like more about Blender and about simulations and yeah, just like stuff that you are that you actually want to be doing. So um, yeah, this is uh, I guess this is it. Carol, thanks so much much and yeah, just to round you. Yeah, just to round up everyone, uh, when you go to your student zone at Art Heroes, you can easily find a code how to access uh, 80 level. And uh, if you guys, whoever is watching this video are uh, not an Art Heroes student yet, which is, uh, I don't know why this has ever happened to anyone <laughs> who is in this industry, uh, welcome to go to artheroes.co and uh, uh, check out our programs. And uh, we've got a really neat community, super happy to help everyone to learn a little bit more about uh, character design and uh, uh, 3D art in general. Kiro, thank you so much again for being here with us. Yeah, thank you guys. Useful. Thank you for inviting we've got, me. Uh, we've got a lot of love going in the chat. <laughs> uh, thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye.